During a cross-examination between Anti-Corruption Commission investigator Carl Kluter and lawyer Richard Medkoff, the court learned that Fishrod lawyer Marin de Klerk had allegedly been diagnosed with a mental condition and is currently in a psychiatric hospital in South Africa. Richard Metcalf, the lawyer representing Bernard Essau and Thompson Haitui Kulipi, told the court that co-owner of De Klerk Horn and Kutsia Inc., Marin De Klerk, is in a psychiatric hospital in South Africa. He used this as an argument against ACC investigator Carl Kluter as to why De Klerk moved so much money between various accounts. The state defense team also requested that the bail application for former Fish Corps CEO Mike Nipunya and co-accused Ricardo Gustavo to be merged and form part of the same court hearing. However, Metcalf rejected the request and referred to the state's request as trial by hijacking. Beside the former fisheries minister Bernard Essau and his son-in-law Thompson Haitui Kulipi, other fish fraud accused include ex-Justice Minister Saki Shangala, as well as the ex-Investec Managing Director James Haitui Kulipi, former Investec Asset Management Namibia Client Director Ricardo Gustavo, Mike Nipunya, the suspended CEO of Fish Corps, and several other suspects who are all implicated in the fish rod scandal. The bail hearing of former fisheries minister Bernard Essau and Thompson Haitui Kulipi will continue on the 21st of July 2020. And he made sure I did too. Because of him, I studied every day. And I did well. He helped me start my first business. It's only now I understand. My father always had big dreams for me. And now, my dreams are the same as my father's. In 100 years, we've learned that times change, but what matters never will. The High Court recently passed a judgment in favor of the Namibian Employers' Federation in a case against President Hagi Genkop, the Labor Ministry, and trade unions. The High Court ruled that the labor regulations issued by the President during the state of emergency, which made retrenchments illegal during the lockdown period, were unconstitutional. Tukna leader Mahongora Kavihuha claims that the Attorney General Festus Bandeka, Labor Minister Utoni Nuyoma and Justice Minister Yvonne Dausep acted incompetent in dealing with legal affairs as they failed to defend the constitutional powers of the President during a state of emergency. I think that the Attorney General must be dismissed with, 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 with immediate effect and plus the Minister of Justice was also dismissed with immediate effect. Why should they be? It's very simple. This is, a, this is a legal process where every person must, especially when you are a first respondent, you must at least dispose because the issue is around you. I don't know why they opted not the president not to dispose, but they used the minister of, 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 of I mean, the minister of labor plus the himself to defend the decision that is not his, because the state of emergency is his is the president's decision. And, and, and to us, that's supposed to be a, a priority number one because uh, no one is above the law. So for a president to depose the, 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 the affidavit and defend his decision, I think that even a grade one child should have understood why the, the, he should have to do so. And failure for the adults that we think is supposed to have the knowledge of law in that respect, it shows that they are completely incompetent in where we stand for. So they must be dismissed with immediate effect uh, with the president. And if president failed to do so, I think it, it, won't, it won't be an uh, unhonorable uh, thing to request him even to step down because he have taken oath to defend and protect the Namibian constitution. If his decision that he have taken proven to be unconstitutional, it means that he failed to defend and protect the constitution. 
And by doing so, it shows clearly that you do not fit to be there. So in light where the workers now are bleeding, where the economy is bleeding, and yet the leaders that was mandated to take a, a, a decisions within the parameter of the constitutions are doing opposite and they are not coming to the workers to explain what is happening. They are still enjoying the offices. So to us, the trade unions and the workers in general, we are not happy with it. But of course, the, 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 the ruling of the court did not substitute what is required in the labor law. According to labor researcher Herbert Yauch, the High Court has set a precedent which suggests that during a state of emergency, the President can only make regulations that directly deal with the source of the COVID-19 crisis and not regulations that are directed at protecting the jobs of the workers. In general, the Labor Act says um, employers can retrench, but before doing that, they need to look at alternative options, um, how to avoid retrenchments or at least minimize them. In other words, they need to first talk to the workers concerned and to trade unions to do that. And during a period of lockdown, of course, that was hardly possible, because how do you meet when you can't leave your house? Um, and it's against that background that regulation came in saying no retrenchments and no forced leave during that lockdown period. Employers have gone ahead, done it uh, nonetheless, and they took the matter to court. And the High Court now, in what's in my view a very problematic ruling, said no, the President can only make regulations that deal directly with the source of the crisis, in this case with the virus and protecting workers' jobs is not dealing with the virus. Now, this is a, an odd argument in my view, because um, the lockdown that came about as a result of the virus prevented workers from going to work, and, and therefore there was a need to protect their incomes and their livelihoods. Uh, but be that as it may, this was the judgment, and what it means practically is that employers will now feel emboldened to go ahead with retrenchments to say now it's even unconstitutional that the president tried to prevent us from retrenching during that period. We're talking only of the lockdown period, not um, indefinitely. And uh, government has now decided to take the matter to appeal to the Supreme Court and hopefully there will be another outcome because going forward what is important to understand is if during a state of emergency a president cannot make regulations to protect workers' uh, incomes and livelihoods, then they, they're really um, exposed and they're left virtually at the mercy of, of employers. Some employers out of their goodwill might be willing to look at other alternatives, but other employers will use such uh, pandemics to, to just retrench straight away. The Labor Commissioner reports that during the period from 27 March to 30th June 2020, 388 companies gave notice of their intention to dismiss a total of 5,748 employees. Employers from the Comas region gave notice of the highest numbers of intended dismissals with 2,838 employees. Labor experts have also predicted that the figures could rapidly increase in the course of this year. With us on hashtag learn on one tell us what you're learning and where you're learning it from send us your name and town to the one africa tv's whatsapp on 081 2006659 or send an sms to triple five one africa tv it just gets better The debate on the legalization of abortion in Namibia was set off by an online petition followed by the motion tabled in the National Assembly by the Health Ministry's Deputy Minister who says although it has been brought up several times in the past in the National Assembly, the topic has never reached a conclusion. Esther Munyangwe, Deputy Minister of Health and Social Services, noted that because of its complexity and the many factors involved, action on whether to legalize abortion or not will take a while to be concluded. It's not the first time also 
that this topic is, is coming up in the National Assembly. So what does it tell you? It tells you that it has been discussed, but it, there was never a conclusion to it. I also understand that in the time of uh, Honorable Libertina Madila, when she was the minister of this ministry, there was also uh, an attempt to discuss the issue. People went out to communities and so on. So that shows that it has been coming on for a long time. And that is why, as a ministry also, uh, we think that it may be about time to come to a conclusion and decide what exactly needs to be done. At the moment, we are very far from legalizing or not legalizing it. Because we first need to hear the opinions, the different views that people have. Let us understand the topic holistically, because it's not just abortion. It, it, it's more than that. You have the cultural factors, you have cultural values that are also attached to the topic. Paralegal at the Legal Assistance Center says Namibia is still in the early stages of making a decision on the matter, adding that once made, it should support women's reproductive rights. In terms of Namibia, we are still in the baby stage, uh, baby steps uh, stage. So we need to consider a lot of things. It's not a straightforward answer. It's not an answer that you can say, yeah, definitely it will be good for Namibia or it will not be good. Um, if you, for instance, take, um, you know, if you have the money. To go for a legal abortion, you can easily go to South Africa and get an abortion and come back. But then the question is, what about the the, the, the woman who cannot afford, you know, um, to do a legal abortion, for instance, in another country? So there's a lot of things that we still need to consider. It's it's not a black and white answer. Although some of uh, the people in Namibia oppose abortions, we feel that it should not be mandated by by, by law. It should be about a personal choice that any woman um, is having. So um, there is no scientific uh, uh, or human rights based um, consensus on the issue. It's very important for all to know. Purely religious views cannot be imposed on the public law um, in, in a circular state like Namibia. We advocate for uh, that increase. Um, scope uh, to decide on whether or not to have an abortion uh, should be couple of, uh, a couple of things. Firstly, you know, the improved access of family planning for, 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 for everyone, but especially for girls uh, and women. We also need to have continued action to prevent gender-based violence and gender inequality. Uh, which can lead to unwanted pregnancies. In um, uh, most abortions, or some abortions, is a result of unwanted pregnancies in Namibia. Mwinyangwe further urged Namibians to keep an open mind and not follow emotions when engaging in the matter. The motion is very clear. It's about creating platforms for the Namibians to express themselves, to talk about the issue, and, and that is why the open debate and discussion, because we also want to hear from the pro-choice. What are their arguments? What are their justification? What do they say? Is it only about that the woman, is, it's her body and it's her right and she has to, to decide on her body? Yes, that is true, one understands that. But her rights should also be accompanied with responsibilities and even when we talk about pro-life it, it does it should not only end with keeping the, ba the baby the pregnancy giving birth and after birth you get rid of the baby and give it to someone else to take care of that child so that should also be pro-life because now I have to provide life and livelihood to this person that I'm bringing into the world so it's a lot of things that we need to argue. My father worked hard. And he made sure I did too. 
because of him, I studied every day. And I did well. He helped me start my first business. It's only now I understand. My father always had big dreams for me. And now, my dreams are the same as my father's. In 100 years, we've learned that times change, but what matters never will. A community member in Ombili living with HIV AIDS has been facing stigma and harassment from those in her vicinity. The 40-year-old said that she and her three children have not received support from the community but are the victims of continuous verbal abuse. The unemployed mother of three whose identity could not be revealed claims that she was diagnosed with a virus seven years ago and has since been facing stigma by those around her. She even says that some of her neighbors refuse to let their kids play with her young ones. I need assistance where I live is very small. I received these corrugated iron from a project that has been assisting me and I have three kids. They go to school but I am unemployed. I am pleading for more assistance from the public in any way possible. It can be buying clothes for my kids or even employing me to wash clothes. I was recently arrested by the police and I was locked up for two days after I reported my neighbor to the police because she's always stigmatizing me. Every time I go to the hospital, my neighbor is always telling me that I am having the virus, telling me that my children and I are dead bodies walking, telling me that I am not a person, and she's always beating me whenever I am outside cooking for my kids. So I opened a case against her, but I ended up sleeping in jail too. Most of my neighbors are not really keen to assist me. It's only Marta that assists me. My kids are suffering due to my status. My neighbors don't even want to play with my children because they are disgusted by them because of my status. We are not counted in this community of ours because everyone is calling us names like poor people, hungry people, and that we survive on assistance from people only and that we have never bought anything from a shop. The 40-year-old says that her status will not discourage her from her dream of opening her own business one day and taking care of her family. They can even help me set up a small business. When the community members see that I receive assistance, they look at me like I am not a person at all. They even call me names and insult me. Today on one spoke to HIV and AIDS activist Emmanuel Shefeni, who was not surprised by the case, stating that stigma against those living with the virus is still a challenge in Namibia, where more than 300,000 people are infected. The stigma is still here, it's just that it's now a bit... On, 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 on an advanced level, they, it's graduated. Uh, people use some funny terms that the youngster come up with. I mean, they can have a conversation, stigmatizing a certain people living with HIV, but you might not even pick it up. And then you find the one now that is, that is so open. Um, I mean, a person will be among um, the friends, and then one will be called, just like you're talking now, um, a lady is being victimized um, in the community. People are calling her funny names. This is so common. It's still on. Um, it's unfortunate, but now we're supposed to have the stigma dead long time ago. But And it's funny, the people that are educated, the people that uh, went to schools are still the same people who are victimizing others when they're supposed to help with the end of stigma. Um, when it comes to support, support is an ongoing thing. It's not a once-off. Yes, a person can get support, um, let's say psychological support from the hospital, from the um, counselors, for instance. But the, the, the main support is supposed to come from home and then the community, the surrounding community. Um, because if we're not offering a person that is known to be living with HIV, is it, it can cause a big damage to that person and also to other people that are living with HIV but they did not disclose. Um, obviously, the 
the, first, the, 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 the doable thing is to, to go and report, go to the police and, and lay charges against that person. But that is, that's not a solution. What we need is more education on these people. We need to talk to our people. I don't know. We have been doing a lot. The ministry have been doing a lot. A lot of NGOs out there have been trying, but the stigma of HIV, I don't know. Nampol spokesperson urged members of the public to be tolerant and supportive towards one another. Deputy Commissioner Kauna Shikwambi also urged those who feel that their individual rights have been violated by others to report such incidents. For now, the mother of three is also pleading for assistance for her family from the public in any way possible. love to hear from you. Send us your views, comments and videos with your name and town to the One Africa TV's WhatsApp on 081-200-6659 or send an SMS to 555. One Africa TV, it just gets better. In other leading stories, while announcing that the country has recorded 52 new COVID-19 positive cases on Thursday, bringing the total number of cases to 667 by Friday, the Minister of Health and Social Services also announced that the country has recorded its first COVID-19 death. According to the minister's statement, a 45-year-old male presented to Office Bay State Hospital on the 5th of July with a complaint of dizziness, difficulty in breathing and a cough. The patient was admitted with a diagnosis of pneumonia to rule out COVID-19 and was admitted to the transition ward and received treatment and further investigations. On the 6th of July 2020, the patient's condition deteriorated. The patient complained of a respiratory ailment, showed signs of severe renal failure and sepsis. On the 8th of July 2020, the patient's condition worsened. The patient became restless and hyperventilating and died on the same day. On the 10th of July 2020, the results indicated that the patient was COVID-19 positive. He therefore died as a result of COVID-19, said the statement. The Ministry of Mines and Energy confirmed that an earthquake was recorded 85 kilometers south of Karibib in the early hours of Thursday at 1.46 a.m. The event was recorded at six seismic stations of the Namibia Seismology Network, namely Winduk, Kamanyab, Opuo, Karibib, House and Ariam Flay. According to the ministry, the quake registered a preliminary magnitude of 3.9 and was shallow at a depth of less than 10 kilometers, while an aftershock was recorded at 4.13 a.m. near the same station. Precautionary measures issued by the ministry in case of an earthquake include going outside safely when possible if found indoors and finding refuge under a table, otherwise stand near a door frame. If outside, the ministry recommends finding a clear spot that is well clear of buildings, trees, power lines, while facing away from windows. Welcome to Comments Corner, your daily dose of local comments from the hottest social media pages. The man accused of assaulting a pick-and-pay employee last week, Samuel Shikale, appeared in the Windhoek Magistrate Court where he was granted bail of $3,000. Cruz said the main point of the story is that customer service in general in Namibia is bad. Duha said the suspect is innocent until proven guilty. Denzel said so this is the message to perpetrators of crimes that it's okay the justice system will help you get back on the streets. Eugenia asked why he was given bail after assaulting another person. Aki said the accused should forgive himself and engage in anger management. The residents of Tobias and Yoko constituency were pleased to witness the launch of a taxi rank in the Kilimanjaro settlement. 
This means that taxi operators will now be dropping off locals at more affordable price. Jambenge thanked the mayor for the taxi rank but said that the community still wants electricity as they are tired of using candles and eating dry fish every day. Pindano said if it is that easy to put up a taxi rank, then Hakahana also needs to get one. Lucia Lucy said the informal settlement of Havana is in dire need of a taxi rank and a bus stop as well. Peter said in suburban areas of the city, people still pay double. And that is all from Comments Corner. Be sure to post your comments on our social media pages for broadcast every day only on Today and One. Hello and welcome to Turning Points International. We have taken over London. I did it and I, I got burned out. Over time, eBay developed an addictive personality to escape depression. There's some people, they take medication and it actually doesn't work for them. Welcome to today's episode of 700 Club Nigeria. Today on 700 Club Nigeria, a woman encounters inexplicable pain after the delivery of her baby. An interesting chat with the Israeli ambassador to Nigeria. Plus, we learn about the power within our spoken word. My cushion in the land of the living, help me sing. A look at the weather forecast. First, an advisory from the Vintuk Met office. Cold to very cold conditions with frost at places expected in the south, central and eastern regions tomorrow. Please take the necessary precautions. The interior will be partly cloudy and cold to very cold in the south with a few showers in the Karas region at places. Elsewhere, sunny and cold to mild but mild to warm in the north. The coast partly cloudy and mild with a few showers in the south. The wind moderate westerly but fresh southeasterly in the south at times.
try to give them these pamphlets to read and to remind themselves that the disease does actually exist. Also on the program, Mimi will have all the latest sports. She'll be speaking to the coach of South Africa's women's national team, Desiree Ellis, on the African Women's Champions League.